Bona dimignata. Does that work? Good? Good morning. It is truly a pleasure and honor to be here with you this morning. I've had the pleasure of being among you for the past uh, two days. In, on Friday evening and th- yesterday morning, we spent some considerable amount of time, maybe I'm too high, um, talking about how we can reach out with the credibility of the gospel to Muslims around us. And as we know, there's many, many around us. We live in one of the most concentrated areas of Muslims in North America, right here in our own backyard. There are Muslims in Dearborn. There are Muslims in Troy. There are Muslims in Sterling Heights. They're everywhere. They are here for us to engage with and have relationships with and find out what it is that they need that the gospel can provide. I'm here today, this morning, to tell you the story about how Christians did that for me. How they took the time to actually decide that they were going to become uncomfortable in challenging someone, me, in my firmly held beliefs in Islam, with the credibility of the gospel. And they didn't just think to themselves that they're going to give me an emotional answer, or even just an intellectual answer, but an answer that answered my deepest questions about the things of the mind and of the heart. I often ask myself this question, why do people want to hear stories of conversions? Why do we want to hear people's testimonies about where they were and how they came to the Lord? Why do you want to hear these stories? Why do I want to tell you this story? And the answer is this, that everybody's story is a part, a little tile, in a huge stained glass window that the Lord is painting. He's painting a beautiful picture of his own story throughout the world. And my story is a small, tiny, colorful tile in that story, in that stained glass window. And your story about how you became a believer, about how you gave your life to Christ, is another colorful tile in that stained glass window. My hope is that as I share my story with you, that you will be inspired to go reach out to your Muslim friends, your non-believing friends, and offer them the gospel so that they can be yet one more addition to this beautiful stained glass window that the Lord is preparing for us and is creating and is ready to show us when he comes back in his glory and shows us the work of his hand. Now, as I begin talking about my story, I'm reminded of another story. It's the story of uh, an atheist who is walking through the woods And he doesn't believe that God created anything. He doesn't believe in God at all. So he believes that all of this, this beautiful woods he's walking through, is an accident. It's here by pure accident. No one caused it. So he sees the beautiful trees and the beautiful leaves and the flowers and the animals and the chirping birds and the squirrels. And he thinks, oh, this is very beautiful, but it's all an accident. And as he walks along admiring this beautiful accident, that is the world, he comes across another beautiful accident, a bear. And the bear is hungry. And the bear bear begins to chase him. And because accidentally this bear is faster than him, and because accidentally the bear is stronger than him, it knocks him down. And as the bear lifts its paw up to swipe him, to kill him, he says, oh my God. And the bear stops. And the leaves stop falling from the trees, and the streams stop moving. And a light shines down from heaven, and a big booming voice says, You have denied me your whole life. You have taught others to deny me. Why should I save you now? And the atheist says, you know, it would be hypocritical of me to believe in you now. To become a Christian now would be hypocrisy. But, God, could you make the bear a Christian? And God says, very well. And the light goes back up and the leaves start to fall again. The stream starts to go. And the bear puts his paws together and says, thank you, Father, for this food I'm going to receive. The point of that story is that as you walk through life and you find a journey, that you're trying, you're, you're trying to go on a path, and you discover certain truths, sometimes those truths can be painful. My story is about that. My story is about the feeling that I wanted to know what truth was, and I wanted to find truth, but sometimes that truth can be frightening and it can be painful. If you get nothing else out of what I say today, It is this, that as you begin to share your faith with someone who is not a Christian, I don't care if they're an atheist, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a skeptic of whatever kind, they will experience pain. The gospel 
is a promise that we will experience some pain. But what we pay is worth what we get. And it's your job to tell them that. So, that is why our ministry is Aletheia International. Aletheia is the Greek word for truth. We believe that truth is the most important thing. And we ask people to embrace the truth no matter the cost. Because truth has a price. But that truth is worth it. I don't know if I'm on the the screen just yet, but... uh, One second. Um, My story begins as a young Muslim man, born into a, not yet, a Muslim family. And I was encouraged greatly by my parents to take my Islam seriously. There we go. Here we go. I was encouraged by my parents to take Islam very seriously. And I took it very seriously. By the time I was young, as a young Lebanese Shiite, a, Shia is, a Shiite is one of the uh, sects of Islam. It's a minority sect, but it's one of the sects of Islam. I was encouraged to study and spread Islam, to tell non-Muslims all about Islam. And I took that very, very seriously. I had read the Quran, the Muslim holy book, many times. I was studying it, trying to learn it in Arabic as well, and all these things. And I was encouraging non-Muslims to study and learn Islam. Now, I didn't just encourage people to do that. I tried to knock the faith out of Christians. That was my goal. See, I had this crazy idea that if something is true, everyone should believe it. Nowadays, we try to have to soft pedal this. We try to say that, well, it's true for you, but not for me. That happens in society now. Well, that's not what I believed, and I certainly don't believe that now. I thought that Islam was true, and if Islam was true, then everyone should believe it. So I would challenge non-Muslims. And I was an equal opportunity challenger. I would challenge Buddhists, atheists, Christians, whoever it was. But oftentimes, I ran into Christians more, more, and I began to challenge them on things about their, about their beliefs. In order to create a vacuum to get them to abandon Christianity, and I would try to insert Islam into the gap so they would become Muslims. And I was good at it. I'm a good debater. I like to debate. I like to engage. I was studying Islam so I could show you why it was true. I was studying other religions so I could show why they were false. But nine times out of ten, when I would ask a Christian a question, a tough question, I would not get a good response back. Usually I get a blank stare. I'd ask a question like, what do you believe about Christianity? Why are you a Christian? Why are you a Christian? Why do you believe in the Bible? Why do you think it's even remotely true? Why do you have any confidence that the Bible you have today hasn't been changed over 2,000 years? Why do you think Jesus is God? Why do you think there's a trinity? Why? Why all these things? Why are you a Presbyterian? Why are you a Baptist? Why are you Pentecostal? Why are you a Catholic? Why are you any of these things? Oftentimes the answers were either silence, they had no answer, Or, I'm a Baptist because my parents were Baptists. Or I go to church because my parents went to church and they raised me in a family. And I'd ask ask this question, is that a good enough answer? Is that a good enough reason to be something? Is that a good enough reason by itself to be a Pentecostal or a Baptist or a, or a, uh, a Catholic or whatever it might be? Of course it's not. And I would get this blank look. But there was once in a while the occasional annoying Christian who knew what they were talking about. They weren't annoying because they were rude or mean, but they had an answer to my question. You see, I like to debate, but I really like to win debates. And these people wouldn't let me get away with it. They had a response to my challenges. But more important than that, they had a challenge for me. They had a challenge back to me. And so I made my my, my decision. I was going to study many different religions, but specifically Christianity, to find the problems with it, to find more and more problems that I already had in my, in my arsenal. I would study the Bible, not to believe one word of it, not even one word, so that I could find the holes. 
and show Christians how their book is contradictory, how it has been changed. You see, Muslims believe that. Muslims believe that the Bible was once God's word. It was once the revelation from God, but Christians and Jews had changed it over time. And the Quran, the holy book of the Muslims, came to correct those corruptions and prevent any other corruptions in the future. It came to bring true religion back. So I made it my goal to show Christians how this was. Now, as I was reading my Bible, I was in college, and I came across a passage of scripture in the Bible that no one ever really preaches about very often. I hear it once in a while, but I don't hear a whole lot of sermons about this passage. It's found in Luke chapter 3. And it says this. It's about John the Baptist, and he is baptizing people. And he is talking to the leaders of his day, the religious leaders of his day. And he says, So he began a saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, as if that would save them from the wrath to come. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Do you hear what he's saying there? He says, the wrath is coming, God's judgment is coming. Do not think to say to yourself that you have Abraham as your father, as if that alone would save you. For I tell you, God can raise up sons of Abraham from the stones. I'm a young Muslim man. I'm reading this Bible, not wanting to believe anything about it, but I wanted to find ammunition. And all of a sudden, this verse strikes me right in the heart, and it says to me, the Holy Spirit speaking through these words into my mind says to me, Abdu, you have been telling other people that it wasn't a good enough reason to be a Christian because your parents were. Why are you a Muslim? Is it because you were born that way? Like these Jews who are being challenged said, I don't need anything. I'm a, a child of Abraham. I don't need anything. My DNA tells me that I'm saved. Abdu, why do you believe in Islam? You see, I had spent a lot of time justifying my belief in Islam, and that's fine to do. You can do that too as a Christian. If you were raised in the church your whole life, that's perfectly fine. But the primary reason wasn't the evidence. The primary reason that I believed in Islam was because I was supposed to. I was born into it. And I will submit to you, that's not a good enough reason. Because when the challenges come, that begins to turn over in your mind. Why do I believe these things? Is it because I'm supposed to? Because of tradition? Because of emotion? Or is there something real behind this? Now, this changed my thinking, this passage. I didn't become a Christian that day, not even close. That began a, ni a nine year long journey, nine years of study. What happened here though, was that my mind was changed just a little bit, just slightly, just a little bit. You know, if a ship leaves New York to cross the Atlantic, to go to England, and it sets its course, but it's off by just two degrees, just two, and it leaves New York, in five miles, it won't be much further off than where it was when it started. In 10 miles, it won't be further off, much, much, much off course. In 20 miles, a little more. In 100 miles, even more. By the time it crosses the Atlantic Ocean, it could end up in Africa. All that this took was a slight split, a slight course correction. It changed my mind slightly. It began to, my mind began to be critical not just of Christianity, not just of Judaism, not just of atheism or Buddhism, but of everything, including Islam. I wasn't critical, I didn't doubt Islam, I just didn't take it at face value. I wanted to start investigating it more and saying, is this true for real? or just because I'm supposed to believe it. And that changed my mind slightly. That's how powerful God's word is. It has the effect of changing you even a little bit. Even a little bit. It doesn't require a dramatic change. It does that sometimes, but in my case, it just changed me a little. What happened was, over the course of those years and those months, that I began to study the, study the Bible with this new attitude. As I began to study the Quran, and other world, world religions with this new attitude, I came across an unlikely challenger to my faith. A challenger so incredibly powerful, I never saw it. It shook me 
right to the core of who I was. It shook my soul. I didn't expect this challenger ever because it, it was a challenger that I trusted with my faith as a Muslim. The source of my faith, the faith that I had grown up with, the source I went to for comfort, suddenly challenged my faith. Now, it wasn't a Christian, it wasn't a Muslim, it wasn't a Jew, it wasn't even a person. It was my Quran, the holy book of Islam, the book that I was following. The very book that I had sought comfort and faith through challenged my comfort and my faith. See, I had looked at the Quran finally with eyes that were a little more open. God's spirit had started to stir in me to see these things. And what I found were some verses in the Quran that I had read many times before, but now all of a sudden they challenged me. They're on the screen now, and I'll read them to you in the English. It says, But how will the Jews come to you, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, for judgment, when they already have the Torah which enshrines God's judgment? You see what that verse says? How will they come to you, Muhammad, for judgment when they already have God's revelation in the Torah, the first five books of Moses, which enshrine God's judgment? Now understand this. The Quran for a Muslim is not the God-inspired words. Like you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. So if you read Paul's letters, you see that Paul had, uses his own style, his own style of writing. When you look at Peter's letters, Peter has a different style of writing. So God uses these men to inspire them, so he uses how they write, he uses their temperament, he uses their, their um, intelligence, he uses their experiences to convey his message. But a Muslim does not believe the Quran is like that. The Muslim believes that these are literally God's words spoken through an angel to Muhammad's ear and he just spits them out. It's, there's no style of Muhammad in it. He didn't actually do anything except speak the words. So these are literally God's words. What does that mean? For the Muslim it means that every single word of the Quran is perfect and no other word will do. So when it uses a word, that's the best word and that's the only one. When it uses a sentence, that's the best sentence and that's the only one that could be used. When it uses a paragraph, that's the only one. You cannot change it, it must, that's the best one to use. So when he uses a name or a noun or a verb, a part of speech, and he says it must be in the present tense, like in that verse. How will the Jews come to you when they already have the Torah, which enshrines present tense, right now, God's judgment? That's what he means. He means the Jews have God's judgment right now. Not in the past. See, Muslims believe that the Quran came to correct all the corruptions in the Bible. But that verse in Surah, Surah means chapter, by the way, in Surah 543, it says, wait a minute, the Torah is in the hands of the Jews, and it enshrines God's judgment right now. How could it be corrupted from before? Why would God say they can find God's judgment in the Torah? And then the next verse is the one that really got me thinking, the one that really shook me. It says, let those who follow the gospel, meaning the Christians, judge right now. You Christians, go judge according to what God has revealed in the gospel. Well, if the gospel was corrupted before the Quran came, why would God tell Christians to go to it? In other words, he would be telling them, go to this corrupt book that's so corrupt that it tells blasphemies and lies about me. You see, the Muslims deny that Jesus was God. The Muslims deny that God is a trinity, and they deny that Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead. Yet the gospel teaches all those things. The Muslim says those are corruptions, but why would the Quran say, go and look at the corrupt book for these horrible lies? Unless it wasn't corrupted. And the Muslim was being told, go look at, uh, sorry, the Christian was being told, go look at that uncorrupted book. In fact, the next verses say in the Quran, those who do not follow what God has revealed are the, rebe are the rebellious and they're to be judged for their sin of rebellion, of not reading God's revelation. The Quran goes on. 
I began to study these things and find more and more verses. It says, people of the book. People of the book is what the Quran uses to refer to the Christians and Jews. You will attain nothing until you observe the Torah and the gospel and what has been revealed to you from your Lord. Again, present tense, until you observe right now the Torah and the gospel. How could they observe that if it's been corrupted? And then the, ch the third chapter of the Quran and the second verse says, He has already revealed the Torah and the gospel for the guidance of men. Those that deny God's revelations shall be sternly punished. Do you see the problem that I have as a Muslim now? As I read these verses, do you see the dilemma I find myself in? The dilemma is this. As you read the Quran, you see that it denies certain truths that are found in the gospel. It says, Jesus is not God. There is no trinity. Jesus did not die on that cross. But can you read the gospels, even one of them, and not come away with any of those truths? They're interwoven. They're, 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 they're linked in there. They're there. But I didn't want to believe them because the Quran says that I shouldn't. But the Quran said the Bible was right. In these verses it says, go to the Bible. The Bible is right. But if the Bible is right, then the Quran is wrong because it denies what the Bible says. If the Bible is wrong, the Quran is still wrong because the Quran said the Bible is right. So how do you get around this? How do you do, what do you do with this? These are the things that my mind was churning over and over again. How do I embrace the Bible and the Quran at the same time? You see, there was a conundrum. There was a dilemma in my thinking. You see, if the Bible was God's word at one time, but it was corrupted, then at least two things follow. Two things necessarily follow from that. Understand, if the Bible was God's word, and Muslims believe it once was, but it became corrupted, only two things can, can be possible. God was unable to protect his word from corruption, or he was unwilling to protect it. Now, Muslims believe God is all-powerful. He can do anything. So it cannot be that God is unable to protect his word. In fact, the Muslim believes that he protects the Quran from corruption. But why believe that? If the Bible could be corrupted, the Torah, the Psalms of David, the Injil, the Gospel of, the gospel of uh, Jesus, if these could become corrupted, why believe he could save anything from corruption? You see, the Muslim believes that God is all-powerful, and we agree with him in that. We agree with that. But if God is unable to protect his word from corruption, then he's not all-powerful. But what's the other choice? He is all-powerful. He can save it from corruption, but he's unwilling to protect it. Is that a better situation? It's not. Because if God is unwilling to protect his self-revelation, the very thing we know him by, then how can we trust anything that he reveals? If he's unwilling to protect the Bible... To the point where it has so many corruptions in it that it is utterly blasphemous, and if you believe those things, you go to hell, then he's not trustworthy. Why believe anything? If he says, I'll protect the Quran, why believe that? He didn't do it with the Bible. Why believe he protect the Quran? See, the Muslim believes in an all powerful, trustworthy God. But if the Bible was corrupted, he's either not all powerful or not trustworthy. So the problem for the Muslim is this. He must believe that the Bible was not corrupted. And that's where I was. Because there's no way around this. I've tried it. I've tried it as a Muslim. I've tried to get around this for years. i tried to find ways to get around this dilemma. There was no way around it. I asked Muslims, how do I get out of it? And they never gave me an answer because there wasn't one. This was a serious problem for me. What do you do with this information? As a Muslim who, if you convert to Christianity or anything else other than Islam, you pay a heavy price, a heavy, heavy price. You know, as I walked into the church, I saw all these posters from Open Doors and Voices of the Martyrs about the persecuted church. Some of the greatest and most persecuted people are those who convert from Islam to, to Christianity. They lose everything. I could lose so much. I could lose my identity. You see, I had become a Muslim who was well-respected. I knew what I was talking about. I was a person people would come to with questions. It's who I was. I gave this analogy before, but in the West, if you were to draw a circle and a dot in the middle, in the West, the dot is religious life, and the circle is your whole life, your worldview. 
In the Middle East and in the East, it's the opposite. The dot is your life and the circle is religion. You are defined by your religious belief. So understand, if I were to become a Christian by believing the gospel, I would be committing a suicide of my identity. I would be changing who I was. Everyone in this room, if I were to give to you absolute proof that Christianity is false, would it be easy for you to change your mind? Or would you feel that fear of losing who you are, of your identity in Christ, of your family? Think about how tough that would be. That's what I was facing. And so what did I do with this idea that the Bible has to be God's word and because the Quran says so and I can't be a good Muslim unless I believe it. But the Bible says things that I have to deny. What do I do with that? Well, I do what any good coward would do. I tried to make them agree. I tried to make Islam and Christianity agree with each other. I began to say things like, well, the Bible says things about Jesus like he, he raised from the dead or he was crucified. Okay, I can get around the, the Quran's denial of that by saying the Quran doesn't mean that he was crucified in the sense that he stayed dead. Maybe he was victorious and, and that means, you know, that Jesus is victorious and God always is, is the winner. But it doesn't mean he saved me through, his, through his, his cross. And so I can get around that. Or when the Bible says Jesus is God, like when he says I and the Father are one, what he means is... Uh, that they are one in their same mission. They have the same message, that man should return and repent to God and all these things. That's what he means. See what I was doing there? It's called syncretism. It's the effort to make two things that don't go together, go together. There's a story of someone who tried to do this. He was named Dr. Frankenstein. He tried to take dead things and sew them together to form a living thing. He wanted to create a human life. So he took a bunch of parts of dead people, put electricity in it, and it became something that had no name. It did not know its name. And it hated its own existence, and it killed people because it wanted to find out what it was, and it didn't know. That's what the kind of faith I was trying to create was. I didn't want to make a decision. So I had this misguided mission, this mission to make Islam and Christianity mean the same thing, to try to make them come up with a new religion of myself, Abduism. I don't know what it was. I had an idea. Maybe I'll do this. I tried that for many, many years. But the problem was, as I began to study these things more and understand the differences between Christianity and Islam, as I took the differences, and I did this, I would actually take and catalog and write in a list the differences in the Quran and the Bible and, and, and other teachings of, of, of uh, Islam and the teachings of, the, um, of Christianity, and I would highlight the differences. I would show them in the columns of differences. I was trying to say, oh, this means the same thing. See, I can show that. But the more I did it, the more I was being clubbed over the head with the reality that there is no way to do this. The Quran denies the divinity of Christ. In Surah 572, it says that unbelievers are those who say God is the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. But the Bible affirms it in no uncertain terms. In John 10.30, in John 8.58, when Jesus says, I am the I am, Yahweh, he's saying. John 17.5 and many more. Mark 2, Matthew 9. There's so many places where Jesus says he's God that the Quran denies it. You cannot read the Gospels without talking about the crucifixion and resurrection. John dedicates one-fourth of his gospel to the crucifixion and resurrection. Luke one-third, Matthew, a big portion, Mark, a huge portion of his gospel. You cannot read the gospels without the crucifixion and resurrection. Yet I was trying to say that Islam would agree with it. But then there's this verse in, this, in, in the Quran, in Surah 4, chapter 4, verse 157, it says, and further saying, verily we have slain the Messiah, in other words, the saying the Jews are boasting about this, son of Mary, the apostle of God, they slew him not. Ma kataluhu. They did not kill him. Wa ma salabuhu in Arabic. And they crucified him not. But it appeared to them as if it was so. The Muslims believe that someone else was made to look like Jesus by God so that God could free Jesus from the suffering of the crucifixion. So they deny as history that he died on the cross. Yet the Bible tells me that he did in, in fact that. In fact, that's the reason he came was to be a propitiation for your and my sin. 
So these worldviews were colliding. I was trying my hardest to make them come together. But how do you do that when this evidence is there, when it won't let you do it? How do you do that? I tried that for several, several years. I tried my hardest to make these things come together because I did not want to make a choice because I knew what the choice would mean. I knew what I would lose. But here's the problem. As your mind, your God-given mind and rationale goes over these things, you realize that you have to be honest with your own intelligence. And you can't make things happen and agree just because you want them to. That's not how the world should work. But I was sitting on this fence. I didn't want to get on, off on either side of the fence. But the fence wasn't the kind of fence that was one of those brick fences you could sit on. It was one of those chain link fences with the pointy parts. So it wasn't comfortable to sit on. I didn't want to sit on that fence anymore. But I didn't want to get off either. Well, one day, some friends invited me to a church service. Now, I had been to church before. I had been there for funerals and some weddings and these kind of things, but I'd never been to an actual Sunday service. And I went to that service. It was a beautiful Sunday morning, just like today. And I got up extra early. My friends were coming to pick me up. I was in my parents' house. My friends were coming to pick me up. And I had my Bible open, and I had all these sticky tabs in my Bible. And I had my Quran open, and I had all these sticky tabs in my Quran. And they corresponded with where they disagreed. And there were a lot of them. And I was trying to make them agree that very morning. I was trying my hardest to make them agree. I did not want them to be different. I did not want to make a choice. Well, they got to the house, and they picked me up. And I was quiet. I was very silent. Normally, I'm not like that. If you know me, you know that I, I, I talk quite a bit. I like to talk. It's hard to get me shut up, actually. But I was quiet. I got in the car, and they asked me, what's wrong with you? What's the matter? I'm just tired. You guys dragged me up early on a Sunday morning to come down here. What, you know, what are you guys doing on Sundays like this? Kind of a thing. Went to the church, and it was in a high school, actually, at the time. And you've had that experience, I'm sure you have, where you've been in church, and for some reason you think the pastor's talking to you. No one else in the church service matters. He's talking to you. Somehow he read your diary, he read your journal, or he read your mind. Who knows what happened? But somehow he's talking to you. And normally when you walk out of the service, you feel this sense of calling, this inspiration to change your life. And it's a good thing. Well, that happened to me that day. But I didn't like it at all. It annoyed me. It irritated me because I was being pushed to make a decision. And the pastor at the end of the talk said that God stands at the door and knocks. He leans on the door a little bit. He won't force his way in. He leans on the door a little bit. And if you would just stop leaning back against it, he would open the door and flood the house. And he would change your life. Is that you? And I knew that was me. Now, I walked out of that church service more irritated than when I got there. And as I walked out in the hallways, I could see people from my high school who went to that church. And they looked at me, what are you doing here? And I was, my, my girlfriend at the time, now she's my wife, was standing next to me like, ah, she dragged me here or something. I said something, some kind of excuse. But I was getting more and more upset. We walked out into the parking lot. And again, it was, I remember how beautiful and warm it was outside. And we're walking out in the parking lot, and my wife is, she's now my girl, she was then my girlfriend, now my wife, was walking next to me. And I stopped, and I hunched over like this, because I felt this weight on my back. I was trying to do the impossible, and I said out loud, I can't do it anymore. I cannot do it. I cannot make them agree. I can't carry this burden anymore. And I don't, I'm, in, I'm Lebanese, so I'm emotional, but I don't burst out into emotional fits. I don't cry in front of people. I don't do that. Well, after I became a Christian, I kind of do it more, but I didn't used to do it before. And I began to sob right there in the parking lot. Just began to cry my eyes out and saying, I can't do it, I can't do it. And Nicole, my wife, she was crying her eyes out too. And I think it was because she thought, he's huge. If he falls down, what am I going to do? <laughs> but I made it my decision that day to get off the fence. I didn't become a Christian that day. That's not what had happened. What I did decide was that I was going to spend my waking hours 
making the decision. I was going to study until I couldn't study anymore. See, I was in law school, and I was almost done, and I had to pass the bar exam to become a lawyer. And when I got done with the bar exam, I finally was able to take this time when all my friends were working or in school. I had all this time on my hands because my job didn't start yet. So I had months of time on my hands. I spent eight hours a day, if not longer, studying the differences between Christianity and Islam to see who had the truth. I remember specifically being in my parents' home. I, had lived with, I was still living with them, and I was in the den of my parents' home. And as I was there, I had this big, beautiful desk surrounding me. And on the left side of my desk was all my evidence for, for Islam. All my books, all my articles, all my notes, my sticky notes, everything was up there, as tall as my eye, next to me on the, uh, on the desk. On the right side of me was all the books, evidences, articles, notes, you name it, for the evidence for Christianity, specifically the resurrection of Jesus as a historical fact. Piled as high as my eye. Playing on the computer behind me over the internet was a debate between a Christian and a Muslim about whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. So I was literally surrounded by the evidence. Surrounded by it. And I found the evidence for Christianity to be so compelling. My mind had already accepted it. I believed that the Bible was God's word, that Jesus was God's son, and that Jesus had come to save us from ourselves. And the crucifixion paid the price, and the resurrection shows that he has victory over death. And that we can have life through him. I believed in my mind all those things. My heart would not accept it. Absolutely not. And I began to ask myself, why? Why won't I do it? Why? I know it's there. My mind says it's yes. I know that this is true. Why won't I accept it and believe it? Why? 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 And then the answer walked by the door. My father walked by, and he smiled at me. So proud that I was studying to be a good Muslim. And I thought to myself, how could I break his heart? How could I destroy him? It would destroy him and my mother and my brothers. It would wreck them. How could I do that? How could I take someone who had loved me so much and given so much for me and say, you know what, I'm going to change my views and just destroy them? How could I do that? And that's what it was. It wasn't that the truth wasn't obvious. It's that the truth was painful and had a price. It had a cost. There was a cost of truth, and I wasn't willing to pay it. But I will say this. Over the course of some weeks and some months, as I began to study these things, two things happened. Christians came alongside and said, we know you'll lose a lot. We know it. Jesus promises that, by the way. He promises it. Expect it. It's inevitable. If you haven't already experienced some loss, just wait a while. That's when the loss happens. When you believe and you follow him, he promises that you'll experience it for his name's sake. And they knew that. And they said, we will be your family. If we, need, if we, we, we can't replace your family. No one can ever do that. But we'll try our best. If you lose a job or you need something to, somewhere to stay, we can do that for you. Now, thankfully, none of that happened. I didn't need a home or anything like that. I mean, it didn't happen. But they came alongside me and gave me assurances. But what really struck me was one day as I was reading the Bible, again, I was not yet a Christian, reading the Bible, and I came across a passage in Romans chapter 5. And I realized something when I read that. When you read that, that passage, and I'm going to paraphrase it, Paul is saying, how do we know God loves us? And how do we know the kind of love God has for us? Is it just a love for those who love him back? Or is it a love for his enemies? No other religious system, including Islam, teaches that God loves his enemies. That God's love is that great. It's not that great in any other religion. But Paul says that while we were yet sinners, while we were ungodly, while we were yet Christ's enemies, Christ died for us to save us. I dare you to look for any other religious belief anywhere to try to find that kind of love. And it occurred to me that the greatest possible being, that's God, would, love, would do the greatest possible thing, which is love us, in the greatest possible way, which is self-sacrifice, 
No one knows that but the gospel. And I realized something, that because God so loved me, how could I look at him and say, sorry, that's not enough. The cross is not enough. The bloody, beaten, bruised, swollen, tattered body of Christ on the cross is not enough for me. I need more than that before I'll give up everything else in my life. How could I say that? How could I essentially turn away from my heavenly Father's heart? How could I break his heart by denying and saying, that's not enough? Couldn't do that. Absolutely could not do that. And something happened. When I realized that the cost of truth was high, but what I would get in return, the value of truth, was more, that's when God made me into a son from a stone. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you once again. Um, obviously, Brett has some resources in the back through Crescent Project, but I wanted to encourage you in a couple of things. One is, I'm speaking at a conference coming this weekend in Dearborn with some of the greatest speakers on Islam in the world, um, in Dearborn, this coming week, at the Legacy Conference. If you want to know more about it, there's some cards on the table in the main lobby to, to get you to sign up. Also, if you enjoyed this talk and you want to learn a little more about Islam, we have a CD called Islam from the Inside. It is this talk, that I, it's my testimony, but it gives more detail about Islam. It's available. And then I also have my book in the back. And you can get both of them put together for a special uh, uh, bundle package. Um, so if you want to learn a little more, hear the story a little more, and understand how you can reach out to Muslims, I greatly encourage you to pick up and look at the resources from Crescent Project and that we have available as well. Thank you so much again. It was a true pleasure to be here with you this weekend. God bless you all.